Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Inking Out Loud podcast. Uh, This episode, that being number 11, if my uh, math checks out, we'll be focusing on our first uh, sci-fi novel, A Wrinkle in Time, by Madeleine Nong. Um, As always, I'm your host, Rob Santos. I'm joined by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going? What's up, man? And for the first time, uh, his wife, Lauren. How's it going, Lauren? Hey, how you doing? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm to understand uh, that I think Drew is the odd one out, yes? He's the new one to this book, and both you and I have read this in the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely like elementary school age or something. How? Oh, yeah, okay. I was about to say, for me, it's been... Jesus, it's probably been about 15 years since I read this book last. Um, I read it many, many times as a young man. I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. I haven't picked it up since then. I read it on my e-reader, so uh, it, it's, it, it was definitely a walk down memory lane for sure. Uh, Drew, what did you think, my man? This was your first time reading A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of an interesting experience because it's very definitely written for a younger audience. Uh, yep. I, I think this is a book that, hmm. like Lauren and you, most people read as you know young teens or preteens and yes so reading it as an adult brought a different perspective in um you know it was it's a drastic departure from the kind of stuff i'm used to reading so yeah i thought definitely. it was a decent book you know very fast paced uh fun characters i, I thought the characters yep. were the strongest element of the book uh and then and then she did a good job with just sort of some of the creepy settings that was probably yeah. my you know the- like, she was she's very good at establishing an unsettling <laughs> atmosphere, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was a totally different experience this time around reading it as a 27-year-old man instead of a, you know, a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy. I picked up on a lot of things that I hadn't picked up on before. Did you remember um, most of it? Sorry, say again? Was it were you rusty? Did you remember a lot of it or Yeah, like I I'll be completely honest, uh I I was uh, I was being a bit procrastinative. Is that a word? It is now. Let's go. Let's roll with it. <laughs> I um, <laughs> I read probably eighty percent of the book this time through on my reread. Uh, I didn't have quite time to finish it, but I did, of course, skip ahead to the very end and make sure I got that those last few pages in. I read it dozens and dozens of times, like times as a little guy. But um, I remember most of it. Some of it's going to be shaken loose with our conversations here, and, and I'm sure I'll go off on some tangents. Um, but it, it's a book that definitely really, really shaped uh, me as a reader when I was a young guy. Um, I hadn't read anything quite like that before. Mm-hmm. This was before I read The Wheel of Time. This was before I read any kind of epic fantasy. This was during the same time as I was discovering, like, say, Harry Potter. So um, it's okay. a bit of a drastic departure from those. A lot smaller, a lot faster paced, as you said, Drew. Um, I think it's... We, we do need to keep in mind that this book was written in 1962. Yep. This is this this book is a if if my math checks out here a 57 year old book or at least going on 57 years at this point. So uh, it definitely shows its age in some ways. Um, but like I, I was surprised this time around being able to actually conceptualize just how old this book was to appreciate it for the time period in which it was written and how it really doesn't draw you too much out of it. There's not too much, uh, there aren't too many moments where you're like, oh, okay, okay, well, this could have been solved with X or this could have been solved with Y due to our our current technology. Um, Mm -hmm. It's very fantastical. It's very fun. I loved the characters. I loved the Miss W's. Um, The uh, the, the, the main character is the protagonist, Meg she was uh, a lot more interesting this time around. I was, you know, I didn't appreciate that character too much when I was, or as much as I do now, I should say, when I was when I was a young man. Okay. Um, well, I suppose I still am, depending on your on how you consider a young man to be. Um, but the setting, like up to this point in the podcast, in the Inking Out Loud podcast, we've just been focusing on on fantasy books, on on you know, on high fantasy. This is a, a drastic departure from what we've been doing up until this point. So that's actually a, kind of a talking point that i wanted to bring up yeah yeah and let's let's head down that path it's you know you can call this book science fiction but it's not hard Mm -hmm. science fiction there are fantastic elements in it yes you know it was it when i think of science fiction fantasy blended there are a few different flavors of that probably the most uh you know famous is star wars which has all the trappings of science fiction but naturally is a fantasy story uh and then, and then you get something like this, which 
has like less it, it has more trappings of fantasy but then has kind of a focus on sort of science fictiony technology with the tesseract yeah and and then you have kind of another uh blend of that in a different way with something like for instance gene wolf's book of the new sun that it presents itself as fantasy mm. but as you read closer you realize oh this is a far future earth and there are laser weapons and intergalactic or interstellar travel and the tower that he lives in is literally a rocket ship <laughs> and stuff like that. So oh, now you just made me want to read that one more. Oh, you should. Yeah. We'll, read it, Lauren? It's pretty we'll good. Oh, we'll if definitely we, be getting there in this podcast. If we get there in this podcast, I don't, I don't know how exactly we're going to do it. Cause I mean, there's a lot it's heavy to dig reading. into there. It's right. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and if, you know, if we do get there, it's going to be a while. And if any of our listeners are interested in something like that, I want to give a shout out to another podcast that is excellent called Alzebo Soup. And they cover oh, a yeah. lot of Gene Wolfe books. And uh, I believe right now they are in the middle of Citadel of the Autark, which is the fourth and final Book of the New Sun volume. Uh, they do a very good job. Each episode, they cover one or two chapters. And, you know, it's an hour, oh, really? hour and a half per chapter. Dang, basically. so they're doing a, it, a they deep really dive. They really go in depth. You need it though for that book. Yeah. Oh yeah. I imagine. I've I've read some excerpts of his work and I'm left like, oh my god, I could stare at that paragraph for forty five minutes. Yeah. Anyway, we should we should get back to a, yeah, a, a regular, regular time, time, time here. So so it, it has this interesting blend of science fiction and fantasy mm -hmm. uh, that it's whimsical. You know, it's <laughs> Yeah, yes. It's a lot of my talking points are based as around some this. of the other types of that and, and it it's fun. Despite it being honestly kind of a dark book. In some ways, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, like even okay on on the, on the point of this being a dark book, you know, just just to look at the first line on the first page of this book, and it's kind of a cliche line. Again, you have to remember this is almost sixty years old, but it starts off with "It was a dark and stormy night," right? <laughs> yes. Now, it, like I said before, this this book does show its age in some ways, and this is one of them. It's it's kind of a cliche line, but I think it's important to keep in mind that it still does exactly what a lot of our you know, elementary school teachers taught us um, what, like, as an opening line should do. It captures your attention with a brief and powerful statement. It's simple, and it sets the mood, you know, in an instant, very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, and maybe this is just me reading into it. Uh, like, I would love to have seen your, like, your reaction when you read just the first page, and you started so to get a sense of where this felt is going. to me, the fact that it opened with the line, it's, it was a dark and stormy night, felt tongue-in-cheek to me it, it felt self-aware as okay. if she okay. she knew that was a cliche she knew Even it was 60 you know, years ago overdone close? opening but she did it anyway and then she mm. put her own twist on it and mm. and did a good job of taking this cliche and building on it and establishing a really evocative scene with meg up in her room with a, a hurricane you know, yeah. blowing Worried through. that she's going to be sucked yeah. out into the storm when the roof comes off, yeah. And there's there's strong imagery <laughs> there that helps us understand the main character, and it really grounds us in the world and, and in our protagonist's mind. So it was definitely yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and talking about how this book shows its age, we're, we're, I'm going to stay on this subject just mostly at the beginning of the. Uh, I, I want to move on later, but I, I want to bring up um, another point that I found near the beginning because I had so much more to talk about on this read through that, and I think I texted you this, Drew, at one point. I said I'm on page three, and I already have three pages of notes that I want to <laughs> talk about. I really had to start reining myself in. Um, but one of the talking points I wanted to bring up was like. like uh, another way this book kind of starts to show its age. There's an excerpt I wanted to uh, to bring up here, and um, it was in chapter one. I'm pretty sure, and it's obviously the entire book is from Meg's point of view, yeah. and she says, or at least her narrative goes, surely she, and we're speaking of Meg's mother, must know what people were saying, uh, must be aware of the smugly vicious gossip, and of course they're referring to her father. Um, and I want to consider here the fact that Meg Murray's family. Um, it's currently operating without a father figure, and it seems to be a really, really big talk of the town. It seems to be a really big deal uh, for some reason, which nowadays, if, if a character had a missing father figure, it's, it's you know, 
it's it's nothing particularly strange, but it seemed to be a major source of insecurity for Meg, mm-hmm. and, a, and a point that she that she was really bullied on and that she was challenged on. And uh, yeah, I just you know I wanted to to acknowledge that point because, like I said, in a modern setting, you know. Yeah, not a lot of kids are teased about not having a father figure in their family yeah. or, you know, her father ran off with a tramp or something like that, or he hasn't been seen in months. It's like that wouldn't be a big deal in, no. in, in the new millennium. But back then it definitely, it, I guess it definitely was. Yeah. This, you know? this book is heavily influenced by traditional family structures. Oh yeah. And, and that provides the entire motivation for the events of this book. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do you want to talk uh, about the characters individually? Do you have uh, impressions that you want to give? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Definitely? Sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Lauren sounds like she's rearing to go. I want to hear your thoughts, Lauren. Let's let's hear them. Uh, who should we cover first? I suppose the, the protagonist would be logical, right? Meg sure. Murray? Yeah. What did you think fine. of Meg? So I felt like early on in the book, it was clear to me that she really knew her characters well. And that okay. she yeah. was just going to slowly give us pieces of who they were. But I felt like a lot of books, they aren't as well developed. The characters aren't as well developed as they were here, where like, you know, for for Fair Meg, enough, yep. you get an absolute sense of who she is in chapter one. Mm-hmm. And and I felt yeah. like Madeline L. Engel really was like, okay, I'm going to give you piece by piece so that you stay interested. Like... Oh, let's introduce Charles Wallace. He's a genius at five years old. Yeah, that was that was apparent immediately, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like from the first time he walked into the kitchen, you had a sense of like something's up with this boy. Yeah, he's he's, he's, he's not a typical. He's a little too articulate. He's a little too. Oh yeah. You know, aware. You know, yeah. Charles Wallace is is definitely a character I want to discuss at length here. But uh, speaking of Meg specifically. Um, Right off the bat, we you're right, Lauren. We did definitely get a taste right away for who her character was. It does seem it does read like uh, Madeleine Longa had had these ideas for years and years beforehand, and that she was very natural in the way that she unveiled her characteristics and her characters. Um, like drawing back, of course, to Meg, um, we see her insecurity right away. Like she's talking. Okay, so she's talking to the kitten. In, in the scene in the attic, the first mm-hmm. scene in the, in the book. And she says, go to sleep. Just be glad you're a kitten and not a monster like me. And that was a line that really stuck out to me. I was like, okay, so right away we get a feel for how this girl feels about herself. She's a young girl. She's 13 years old. She's, you know, in, the, in these very nebulous, you know, difficult years of any teenager's life. Um, and she makes faces at herself in the mirror. She's showing braces. She adjusts her glasses. And even in the manner in which she mentally describes her hair color, she, she calls it mouse brown. You know, and to me, that's a color that, you know, it implies dirtiness. You know, like a mouse, like this, this feels like a character who, who is small, who feels weak, you know, who feels mm-hmm. insignificant unremarkable. In, in the world. Yeah. Yeah, unremarkable is a good way to put it, definitely. What about you, Drew? Meg? So... She is typical, I think, of lots of young adult main characters. Mm-hmm. It, it's sort I mean, of. I mean, young a adult as a, as a genre, this, not as like. You know, yeah. in books targeting this audience where your main character is an outsider and has problems in school and mm-hmm. maybe isn't socially adept and, you know, doesn't think they're attractive and. So she, she kind of checks off a lot of the boxes that you would expect in a YA book. But Meg doesn't feel tired. She doesn't feel like an unoriginal character. Agreed. Despite right. having, on the surface, a lot of very common YA <clears throat> attributes. So okay. that's sort of one of the things that I appreciated the most about this book was how she she took a lot of things and this goes back to what i was saying with you know the opening line and and even the opening scene where what is on page 2 we get our main character looking in the mirror and describing herself mm-hmm. and yeah. that's a terrible cliche that yeah. you know a, any any contemporary writer now if, if no, they get try to apart. write a book that opens with the main <laughs> character looking in the mirror and describing herself <laughs> any editor is going to slap him on the wrist and say cut it out you know 
But yeah, it, so there. This book is full of cliches, but it doesn't feel exhausted. It doesn't feel like they're cliches. They. You work. think this could have had something to do with the fact that it was written, you know, so long ago that these weren't really cliches yet at the time, and so she wasn't kind of burdened by you know societal expectation and how books were supposed yeah, to. Yeah, I think that plays into it a little bit. But even even with that knowledge of these cliches and these tropes that we have now going back and reading this book it still stands well the writing is good the characters yep. are, are well fleshed out and even though she leans on some of these crutches some of these you know narrative crutches they feel it, it doesn't feel lazy it doesn't feel problematic it mm -hmm. it's natural and it flows well and and yeah we get sucked in easily so it's it, it's yeah. easy to kind of read past the cliches well, there's more to yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. You're not just stuck with the cliche. Like, she's got more to tell you. The world is yeah. bigger than that. Yeah, well, and that's exactly what I mean. Where, you know, going back to my point about the, the first sentence, it was a dark and stormy night. And then the next sentence is where she takes this cliche opening line and twists it and makes it something interesting and something different. That The very next line? I believe the very next line is when she brings up the hurricane. Let me let me grab my book real quick here. Uh, I got my e-reader right here too. Okay, no, no, it wasn't quite the the second line, but the second line is still my point stands. In her attic bedroom, Margaret Murray, wrapped in an old patchwork quilt, sat on the foot of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashing of the wind. Yes, that right there gives us more detail on the setting. Giving us the idea there are, there are trees mm -hmm. outside, right? And it, it gives us a more visceral image of how stormy is it? The lashing yeah. of the wind, you know? And yes. at the same time, it gives us a, a, a character moment where she is wrapped in an old patchwork quilt and she sat on the foot of her bed. Mm -hmm. Like, these are, oh, these are yeah. little details that give us information and help us come to know the main character very very quickly yeah so yeah it, it absolutely the, the focus isn't really on it was a dark and stormy night that's not the line that's doing the work it sets the scene and then yeah she it brings you in does work for the character and for the setting building off of that foundation yes absolutely i, I agree i agree i didn't notice uh i didn't quite notice that she was sitting on the foot of her bed that's a detail that i missed out on and i think you're right that's actually an important uh distinction to make there um, yeah it gives you kind so, of a sense of you know she's she's not wrapped under her blankets cuddled lying down in her bed where yeah presumably you're most comfortable she's sitting at the foot of her bed wrapped in an old quilt which tells you she's uncomfortable she's out of place yeah you know yeah and, and it gives us a sense that something something is impending so you know something um something is about to happen like the scene is set very uh i don't know how i want to set it i i don't know how i want to explain it but it, you like immediately even even as a 10 11 year old i i was like okay so there's a storm happening outside something climactic i guess it kind of it's a it draws that that sense that of of urgency um, and of course, you know, as you've mentioned earlier, with the pacing of this book, we immediately get things happening. We mm -hmm. get a strange visitor arriving in the night, you know, through a storm. Again, kind of a, you know, a fantasy sci-fi cliche. Um, but again, it feels completely natural. Um, we get our introduction to uh, who I think is probably my favorite character in this book, Miss What's It. Really? You want to talk about Miss What's It? You want to you want to dive into that right now? Are we uh, have we wrapped up on our general yeah, thoughts I, I about Meg Murray for now? Why Miss Mrs. What's It is your favorite character in this book? Because she's so carefree. She's so she's so wacky. She's so spectacular. You know, she she first off she has this ultimate mic drop moment at the very end. I think it's the very end of the first chapter. Um, but you know, specifically about Miss What's It. Um, Here's what I here here are my thoughts about Miss Watson. Here's just reading very loosely from uh, from my notes here. Um, oops, I just went all the way to the bottom. That was an accident. Okay, so the introduction of Miss Watson, her character, it was brilliantly strange, is how I wanted to describe it. Um, okay. Right away, Charles Wallace recognizes her. You know, she makes uh, she makes like an offhand comment about ending up here simply because she was blown off course. You know, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. You right away you get the sense. Okay, what? 
is she crazy? Is she, you know, a little loose in the head? Um, she, re- you know, she requests uh, the Russian caviar, which <laughs> was a gift that was secret even from Mrs. Murray, from their father, you know. Uh-huh. Um, she, uh, she even appears to read Meg's mind at one point, you know, asking Charles Wallace to reassure Meg that she is no danger. And then, of course, her exit is just as abrupt and entertaining still as her arrival. She looks... Uh, Mrs. Murray, who is uh, a biologist, a bacteriologist, a scientist, uh, who's married to a physicist, she looks her dead in the eye and says, Speaking of ways, by the way, there is such a, th- such a thing as a tesseract. And then, boom, mic drop, exit stage left, she's gone, yeah. right? Uh, so, just, just, just how brilliantly strange that character is. Um, she's, she's always interesting to read. You never know what's going to come out of her mouth next, if it's going to be something whimsical or if it's going to be something incredibly interesting. So the fact that she was always, Miss What's It was always keeping me on my feet, on my toes, I should say. Um, that's why I liked her character just, just so much. And of course we get a lot, we get a lot more backstory, um, about her later in the scene with a happy medium, um, which was kind of heartbreaking. Um, but yeah, like for now, I want to get your impressions of Miss What's It. Um, or should we just talk about like you know the the, the Miss W's as, as a whole? Yeah, I think yeah, that's Ms. fair W's. as a whole. Um, sure. I didn't particularly love any of them. I mean, they were interesting okay. characters, but I didn't feel any real attachment to them. They felt more like uh, vehicles for the plot than okay. Okay. characters for me to really dig into. You know, they're they're not really dynamic characters. They don't change at all. They don't show much depth other than in a, you know a few individual character quirks uh the closest we get to that is that moment you mentioned with the happy medium where we find out that she was a yeah. star and and died she was a star. The, yeah. and she so loved being a star they serve a role in the story they do they do their job well it you know it was sort of a convenient not quite deus ex machina sure you know they were Fun and interesting. I, of the three <laughs> of them, sound... I probably liked Mrs. Witch the most. The one who stays okay. in corporeal. She's the oldest. Yeah, I, I see. Lauren, I totally agree. That was my thought immediately. Yeah, you, you would. Yeah. Yeah. Not 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 to <laughs> not to be condescending at all. I no, don't know what that Miss... says about me, but <laughs> no, no. Miss Miss Witch is the oldest. She's the one with all the knowledge. You know, she's yes. the one that tries to keep them on track. Miss What's It, of course, being fun. And, and, and just prancing around and, and going from, you know, just, just subject to subject in a carefree manner, she does kind of feel young and naive, even though she's presented as this really old, really wise character. Miss Witch, on the other hand, completely fills that role that we need. The, the, the one who is, who is old, the one who has experienced a lot, uh, the one who, you know, keeps everybody focused and on track. So and yet it's yeah. not all powerful. She can't do everything yeah, no, for yeah. the characters. And yeah, she, she can't she just hard time solve all their problems. The humans, she she forgets the exigencies of being a human and almost kills them <laughs> at one point. Yeah. yeah, that was and and I I really particularly loved that that character uh, dynamic. Well, not the dynamic, the chemistry between the three Miss Ws when Miss What's It and Miss Who were just cracking up at the expense of Miss Witch for making <laughs> such a simple mistake. Yeah. Despite how old and wise she is supposed to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Lauren? So. Do you have thoughts on the... the on the Ws? On the Miss Ws? Ws? I, I'm still interested. I want to keep going. I want to know more about them. They definitely... I want to know about where they come from. Yes, yeah. I want to know more yeah. about their characters. and Because for those who don't know, and I guess we haven't actually explained this yet, for those who don't know or who might not be aware after reading this book, um, A Wrinkle in Time is actually the first of four books in this series. called it's a time, or the, Is it five? Uh, it's it called the... It's to, oh, isn't it the quartet or is it the quintet? No, no, no. It's, it's a called quintet. The time... There's four oh, more quintet. listed there's, at the back. Uh, there's a secondary series, too, that involves the characters still. Oh, gee. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Um, okay, so there's the main four, and then there's another four, which still include, uh, Megan Calvin, and... Megan Calvin are, are adults at this point, yes, and it covers right. the, yeah. I, I would assume. The adventures of the, uh, the younger ones. Yeah, because it includes, like, a, a family tree in the back, and it tells you with each character what books they're in. Oh, 
So that's the physical you have right there in front of you? Yeah. Yeah, see, I, on my uh, on my electronic version, I only have an interview with the author at the end of mine. I do have the physical around here somewhere, but I haven't seen it since I like since I was in elementary school. It's it's around here somewhere. But yeah, like this is the first of uh, I thought it was the time quartet. It's the quintet, isn't it? Well, there it is the quintet. So listed on yeah, the back so of the are... book, it says yeah. other titles in the time quintet are, and it's a wind in the door, a swiftly tilting planet, many waters, and an acceptable time. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I actually haven't read the rest of those. Hold on, there, there look like looks. I like forget the point eight. I was trying to make. Eight we're talking about the what's Murray it, Oh books. yes. Yeah, and and Lauren, you were talking like you wanted to like you want to know more, just like I do, and I'm I'm sure everybody yeah. else does. Do you like? Oh, sh have you read the rest of them, or no. are you like me? You've only read A Wrinkle in Time. I've only read A Wrinkle in Time. Mm. We, we should consider covering those at a future date, because I always wanted to get around to reading those. I personally want to know more about those immortal beings who are Miss What's-It, Miss Who, and Miss Which. Exactly. Those are, like, those are the most interesting characters to me, because they represent so much in this universe. I mean, Miss What's-It is, what, 2.9 billion years old or something yeah. like that? 2.4? Yeah. And she's, she's young. really, really old. And the other two keep <laughs> making fun of her for being so young and naive, right? So I want to I want to read more about them and hopefully maybe if we do cover those well, later and I definitely I'm going to read those books I want to find out more I hope they do give us more info. I mean and are are they all the same type of beings we we don't know for sure. Like Not, are they all stars? like all three of them? Yeah. Well maybe okay so about Miss What's its character here there was there was a perfect description that Meg gave in chapter six, um and and this again the prose here for some reason like like Madeleine Longless seems to have these these small stretches where the prose suddenly changes and you could like, I get the feel that she was just on a roll when she was sitting yeah. there at yeah. her, at, I guess back then it would have been a typewriter. Um, but the perfect description of Miss What's It, I think comes from chapter six. And this is what stuck with me. She says, even though she was used to Miss What's It's odd get up and the very oddness of it was what made her seem so comforting. She realized with fresh shock that it was not Miss What's It herself that Meg was seeing at all. It, the complete, the true Miss What's It, Meg realized, was beyond understanding. What she saw now was only the game Miss What's It was playing. It was an amusing and charming game, full of both laughter and comfort, but it was only the tiniest facet of all things that Miss What's It could be. Yeah. Yeah. So that that right there specifically is why I want to know so much Tell more about more. these characters because I feel like that paragraph was just written so well and it drew us in so much. But then, of course, she just carries on with the plot and you're left there. Oh, I want more. So I, I have a question for the two of you. And okay. I feel like there was a revelation about them that was presented towards the end of the book. Uh, but it's sort of left up in the air. It's never touched on after. Yeah, okay. And it's when... Calvin says they're guardian angels. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Do you this agree is, that this they're is, angels? Do you think they really are angels? A topic that I wanted to... Well, this is loosely re uh, related to, I should say, a topic that I wanted to uh, cover towards the end of this podcast. But I, I definitely do think um, that they are in, in Madeleine Langlois, uh in her beliefs, uh, and, and how she... Because like, she is a Christian. Yes. And um, it does... It, it is... Um, it is evident throughout this book that she is a Christian. Well, there's um, there's a passage one, from the Bible at one point. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think there she, are. I think there's actually a couple. You might be right. I don't know. I haven't personally read the. I haven't personally read the Bible back to front. Um, but the, a lot of a lot of the plot seems to take some roots in Christian faith, and it definitely reads like it. Guardian Angels number one. Um, so, like the, the for example, when the three Miss Ws were explaining what the darkness was. Okay, they were um, they they listed a whole bunch of names. Well, I suppose maybe they led the children to list a whole bunch of names of figures and 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 mankind who were fighting supposedly against yes. this darkness. And I think it, it really uh, it says a lot about uh, Madeleine Longlist's character. Um, the the like the names from you know humankind's past, the most famous human beings that she chooses to list in this struggle against the darkness. Um, she said, like, they, they seem to all be individuals who are, who nurture creation and freedom of expression, um, which, of course, I suppose the logical extrapolation, therefore, means that, I guess, in her universe, the darkness represents ignorance and mundanity and, and uniformity. But, like, they, she has, she lists masters of, of arts, like Michelangelo, 
uh, and Shakespeare, she, the pioneers of science and innovation like Da Vinci, uh, Marie Curie, Euclid. And by the way, where's the shout out to my man Isaac Newton? She didn't list him. I think yeah. he's the one, one of the greatest human beings to ever live, if not the uh, greatest. Anyway, that's just a little nitpick that I had. Um, so I, I actually think you're, you're touching on something important there. and Yeah, yeah. It goes back to... The most important name, to the first one. When they first get to the city, and they're talking to the, uh, the, the paper boy... So, so he says, I got it, I got it. He, it's the boy is talking about how perfect their world is and, and how yes. they're the best city. But he says, our production levels are the highest. Our factories never close. Our machines never stop rolling. Added to this, we have five poets, one musician, three artists, and six sculptors, all perfectly channeled. And I went, mm -hmm. what? And I immediately am thinking, you know, there very much is a thematic point she makes that you had just addressed how there is this okay. creative force that seems to be the antithesis of the uh -huh. black thing, which is, yeah. you know, a, a driver for uniformity and mm -hmm. blandness and lack of expression. Yeah. And this one sentence here implies that there is some manner in which the black thing can suck that creative force out Interesting. of artists Channeled and perfectly. use it to Specifically fuel with itself somehow or, or use it to fuel right. its mechanisms. What do you, why That's do you interesting. Because that? he says they're channeled. Yeah, the, the, like yeah, the, the, wonder... the manner, the specific words they use, channeled perfectly. Yeah. That's an I, interesting point. See, I thought it meant that he was controlling them directly and like controlling the output of the artistic energy the way that he wanted it to be. I that mean, it maybe, it but it, it is it is using their creative forces for its own ends in uniformity. And that's one of the things I think Madeleine Langle does so well. Is she leaves just enough up to the interpretation of the reader. She doesn't she doesn't bog you down with too much information. She leaves just enough uh, room for your brain to explore smaller avenues while you continue to go forward. Like uh, and drawing back a few more minutes in this uh, discussion here, I wanted to point out the first name that she used as uh, you know this figurehead in the in the struggle against the darkness. The first name that was actually used as, as a character to shout it out as soon as they thought of it was Jesus Christ, which again I think shows you know. Madeleine Langle, who she, like walking the that line, that very very specific line between science and and faith in her religion, um, yeah. So I just I just wanted to to, to draw that to, to point that out uh, uh, and show that. So it, again, wanna... drawing back to your earlier point about the guardian angels, I think this is a repeated theme throughout these book these yeah. books, I should say, or at least this book, yeah. And I have kind of a related note this book, the the idea of this universe that she created and, and how there's uh -huh. this um, sort of metaphysical evil threat that spans worlds mm -hmm. uh, and Darkness. sort of the underlying Christian concepts and it all ties together in a way that reminds me greatly of C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy which I don't know if either of you have read before. Nope. The uh, the first book is called Out of the Silent Planet. No, uh, I haven't uh, had the pleasure. Um, it, it may be something worth checking out, you know, for the podcast later on. It's a classic cool, cool. science Another fiction. Another one to write down. Um, they, there are a lot of similarities between uh, Lewis's Space Trilogy and what went on in this. There were things that reminded me of... Interesting. Um, Mostly on on the metaphysical level, the idea of this right. the sort of formless, shapeless evil that is attacking and trying to subvert worlds one at a time, and that there is a celestial war against it, and the foot soldiers, so to speak, are scientists from Earth. Mm -hmm. So okay. Uh, should we uh, move on to our next character that I've been just aching to discuss? Mr. Is it Charles, Charles Wallace? Wallace? Yes. 
<laughs> yes, I want to talk about Charles Wallace because this little boy is so full of of mystery and intelligence that he's he's like I guess he's just he's kind of a magnet for the reader's attention. At least in my case, he was because yeah. you yeah. know I had a little brother. I grew, I mean I have uh, three little siblings, and of course. Anybody with little siblings knows that they do not act this way, typically. Nope. You know, uh, Charles Wallace, uh, he, he somehow comes off as innocent in, in, in many ways. Like, you know, again, looking at uh, Longla's, her, her, her verbatim, you know, the, the words that she chooses to describe him. He's like, uh, he's precious, you know. He's, his feet are sitting there in the kitchen scene at the very beginning. His feet are sitting there swinging six inches off of the mm-hmm. floor as he sits in the chair. Um she says that his pajama covered feet were padding softly across the floor as a kitten's you know he oh. comes across again you know he's like like as this this small person who's in need of protection who's who's very innocent but at the same time he's astonishingly articulate and he's almost creepily astute with the application of his particular abilities like even what he's doing throughout the entire scene if you pay attention um, he's making sandwiches, but it's not just regular sandwiches, not, not a four-year-old sandwiches, you know, he's, he's going along with their rather complex conversation, and he's still asking them each, like, complex details about what, what they want at the moment for their sandwiches, you know, and using I think words. it's like, yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it's made to instill the reader with a sense that Charles Wallace, you know, mentally speaking, I think is actually closer to Meg's own 13 years, at least, and in, throughout the narrative we see startling moments where he he appears even more mature than that. Oh yeah. yeah. Like like what like what do you guys think of Charles Wallace? How do you how like how did you find him? He was my favorite character in this book. Yeah? Uh, okay. By a lot. He was just fun. His mm-hmm. banter was amusing <laughs> when it wasn't interesting and insightful. Uh Okay. I loved what happened with his character that he was the one who who kind of went into the heart of darkness and you know it knew that there was a chance he wouldn't be coming out but did it anyway to try to get information which i think was you know a, a really interesting character moment for him because it's he's presented as somebody who's really really smart smart beyond his years but he has these little character moments, including that one, his, his most pivotal moment, where you, you get this sense that even though he's really smart like this, he still thirsts for further knowledge. Yes. And I thought he was a very compelling character because of that. Yeah. Me? Yeah, he... Sorry, Sorry go, go on. No, no, no. I actually didn't have a specific thing to say. I was, I was planning to just wing that one. But if you have something, go ahead. Yeah, so for me, there were times where I would question, why did you make this character five years old? He, I mean, he, you can portray that sense of innocence if he's still a child. But I, there were so many times where I was like, he's not five. He doesn't think like a five-year-old. He doesn't read like I mean, it. I know he's smarter, but you still have a level of immaturity well, with a five-year-old. Why say he's five? That's the point of his character, though, is that he's not yeah. a five-year-old human being. He is something else. You know? And also, yeah. you gotta he... have your, your creepy, <laughs> possessed little oh, child. Geez. You know? <laughs> yeah, that, that takes it a little away from, like, YA. You've got some things that'll, like, give you nightmares. Yeah. Like it. Yeah. And Charles Wallace I, being I... possessed. <laughs> okay, so oh, really, really quick before we continue on there, you said it. That's how we're going to pronounce this, right? It, not it. It, it is. Yeah, there is one specific point where there's one moment where they they, they use say it in itself. context itself. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, good. Because that's something that bothered the shit out of me. Sorry, again, sorry, Pat. You're going to have to censor that later. But as a kid, I was always like switching in the middle of a paragraph. I was like itself. IT wants us to go there. IT wants us to do this. And it's going, then it, it. And I kept, I keep, even now, I keep changing the, the way I, I, I suppose I mentally pronounce it. Mm-hmm. And it was driving me nuts. But if we could just agree here on that, we could just call it itself. And you had that same thought. You noticed that same moment when they used it in context? Yeah. And it, it was I itself. was keeping an eye it. out for something like that. Thank you. Uh, okay. For Good. an indicator that would tell me, is this an abbreviation? Or is yeah. this the word it? 
capitalized. And mm-hmm. once I saw that, I, I kind of put it in context. And the context I put it into was, it's like the Dark One. Yeah. Okay. In the Wheel yeah, of Time, it's it basically... talks in all caps. You know, yeah, or it names exactly. itself in all caps. It, so. it talked in all caps in the... In the in I the so. fuck in the physical copy because it didn't in my e-reader I don't remember it did it talk in all caps it well it never directly talks it always talks through people oh but, that's right but I'm, it talked through I was just saying okay. the fact that it was always named yeah with it is named all caps yeah. reminded me of the dark one in the wheel of time yeah, yeah. It, there's a parallel there for sure and of course this this one force that seeks to to dominate the universe and that yes. shadows other planets and si- and sets them into darkness yeah there's definitely a uh a bit of a parallel there for sure to be had mm-hmm. um any other characters specifically that we want to discuss or we just we, do we want to focus on you know Langlois style and what she managed to uh and how we like you know how we found this book and and its plot and everything I don't think I have anything else really character specific to bring up do you lauren sure sure i mean i loved the parents but they aren't necessarily the point of the book yeah exactly yeah yeah the like at first it kind of seemed like miss murray or mrs murray i should say uh was going maybe to be a little more uh involved in the plot but she's pretty much left behind um in chapter two or chapter three just right there and we don't see her again for the rest of the book including well no that's right we did see her again in the very very yeah, last the scene uh mr uh mr murray we got the the uh, approximately the same amount of page time with mr murray of course near the end um but yeah the, uh, i agree i agree with lauren they weren't really central to the plot they didn't really have much to do besides you know being you know, uh, for example, in Mr. Murray's case, a narrative device. You know, mm-hmm. we need to get there. We need, we need to save him. What's been happening to him? Um, but I, I suppose the last uh, specific character point I wanted to draw was about the protagonist, of course, Meg Murray, and about her character arc, about her dynamic, how, how she was at the very beginning of the book compared to where she left off. Okay. Um, and I want to talk in terms of specific moments in which we see her character start to change and where she finished her change. So, for example, uh, I think the first time we, we finally sees Meg character, uh, we finally see Meg's character starting to change is when she, and I quote, loses her brother to it. Um, in, the vel- in the elevator, as she and Calvin and a pseudo-hypnotized Charles Wallace approach her father's prison, Charles Wallace accuses Meg of having so much difficulty back at home uh, because she hates being different, mm-hmm. right? Um, but Meg replies... Maybe I don't like being different, but I don't want to be like everybody else either. Yeah. And I think that is where she really started to change who she was, where yeah. this, this journey started to affect her in a profound and everlasting way. Um, of course, going on from that, I think the moment where she eventually made the choice of who she was going to be uh, was when they were discussing um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the other alien planet. I can't remember what it was called. It was a weirdly pronounced name with Ant Beast and all those tentacle-like monsters who couldn't see, but who were so kind oh, and nurturing. I don't remember what that uh, was it's called. Like, it's like Ixchil or yeah. something yeah. like that. Um, uh. But this Ixchil, Ixchil, some, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, oh, you looking I'll, it up? I'll find it. Here, you're little. Okay. But uh, anyway, like, um, they were discussing who should return to Kamazots for Charles Wallace. And uh, Miss Whatsit asks Meg, do you have the courage to return alone? And in that moment, Meg officially decided, well, she says, no, but it doesn't matter. And I think it's, it's in that moment she decided that there are more important things um, to her than her fear. Yeah. Which ultimately leads to her discovering that it's her love for Charles Wallace and her connection with Charles Wallace that ultimately makes her the perfect person to return and the only person that is able to save him from the clutches mm-hmm. of this darkness that it represents. So on the topic of her character arc and her her progression and change over the course of the book, I think it's complicated a little bit because while she does gain a a self-awareness and an understanding of what she is like, the book goes out of its way to resist fixing her flaws because her Mm -hmm. flaws are framed in a way through, I don't remember if it was Mrs. Who or Mrs... 
that says these are your strengths? Yeah, these are your flaws are your strengths. Or yeah, your to you, I strengths. grant you your flaws. Uh, let and me see. I think it was Mrs. Witch, but I'm not entirely yeah, sure. I want to check that out really quick. Anyway, so go on. We're presented with things that normally these are character traits that would be overcome or changed or adapted to in some way. Whereas in this book, they're just kind of left there to remain. And mm -hmm. I would be curious to see how much that changes in later books in this series. But I think that makes this sort of a, you know, for lack of a better word, complicated character arc. Because in some ways it is stagnant. And in others, she does make progress. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I just found it, by the way. It was Miss What's It. That it was, was Miss What's It. Okay. Them. Yeah, it, it was Miss Who's Glasses that, that they got, you know, to be able to traverse the uh, right. the, the prison. But yeah. it was Miss What's It that was individually at the beginning granting them. And who, and who said to Meg, you know, and for, uh, like, uh, Meg, I give you your faults. And so for you, I will strengthen this gift. Right, and mm -hmm. ultimately we found out that it was her stubbornness, her anger, you know, her incredulity at trying to be labeled like everybody else, and her connection, her singular connection to Charles Wallace that ended up, you know, saving the day ultimately. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, anything else we want to cover before we get into the final draft? Yes, yes, big thing. So. Okay, let's hear it. So as soon as they got to Camazots, you know, okay. and they're starting to walk down and see the the houses and the people and the kids are bouncing the balls at exactly the same time the same tempo and yep. all the skipping ropes are, skipping are rope. hitting at the same tempo yeah my first thought was oh my gosh 1984 george orwell oh okay 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 and I... so i started re-listening to 1984 and holy cow like there are so many similarities to Camazots. Really? Yeah. Like, oh, the I central central intelligence or central mm. central the office. Yeah, and the central central intelligence in which it resides. Yep. yep. Dang, now I, now I have to read. I, and that's one thing that I've always meant to get to eventually is 1984. Uh, have you partaken, Drew? Like, are you, like, have you read? Yeah. Yeah? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I definitely want to check that out then because if it's anything... You're right. If it's anything, if if this is any way related to it, or even drew inspiration from it, it's mm -hmm. probably worth checking out. I yeah, think, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and he wrote it in 1949, and this is 1960. 49. That's how. That's yeah. how old that book is. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Damn. Yeah. That's old. But he's talking about like a big theme is Big Brother. Big Brother is always. Yeah, Big watching. Brother. I know a little bit about it. Big Brother is so, always. <laughs> yeah, that that's exactly. There is nowhere. That it won't see you in this book, Camazot's like. It, so it's like a collective kind of hive yeah. mind thing. Yeah, kind and of you like are required represents. to report to it if you see something that is mm -hmm. not perfect. And everything is very structurally kept in order with a prop. Oh, okay. Yes. So this, all right, all right. I can see exactly how you would draw those connections, and I probably would have drawn the exact same. And with Big Brother, uh, like definitely, you are required to report again anything out of the ordinary. And everybody is required to act just so. And you have so much paperwork. Like. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, <laughs> okay, I just I wanna couldn't help I want to check that out eventually. <laughs> That's one that, I, that, I've, uh, that I've left behind that I need to check out for sure. So I wonder, uh, is she you, saying, Drew? like, oh. in, if it were to be victorious over the earth, if that is what it would look like for our world. Like, yeah. this is what it looks like for Camazots, but I exactly. wonder if... So, yeah. I think there's, a, you know, a, a cultural application. Yes. We're, okay. we're, we're thinking about a book. We're talking about a book here that was written in 19... What was it? 1962? Mm -hmm. We're talking 62, about yep. the middle of the Cold War. Well, it was published in 62, but she had yeah. she'd been planning this book for years and years beforehand. So, you know, we're talking about the middle of the 20th century, the Cold War... The rise of communism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I think she was very much going for a commentary on homogenized communism. Sure. Yep. Yeah. With, you know, and and her her views on that I think are made very clear in this book. 
Yeah, yeah. Like you, again, and drawing back to what I've what I've been bringing up time and time again during this podcast, we have to consider the time era in which this book was written. As Drew just said, 1962. Um, this was written, and this th- these were my closing thoughts that I have, and I wanted to, uh, I like I wanted to draw take a moment back and and exp- and talk about the person who was Madeleine Langle, right? Um, like and and who she was during that time in the uh in the sci-fi and fantasy kind of genre um she was and i did a little bit of research in preparation for this podcast um she was an english major which isn't surprising sure um but she still had a wide love for the sciences you know as evidenced by the fact that much of her plot in this novel revolves around what were at the time groundbreaking advances in the in the like in the fields of theoretical physics and extra dimensional theory um, and even more, which I found particularly interesting, she started attending college in 1937, which means that the most nebulous and challenging years of her life, the, the years that Meg Murray is currently going through, would land somewhere right smack in the middle of the Great Depression. Oh, and, yeah. Oh. And then on, to- and on top of that, even, this was during a time when there was still a very unfair stigma upon, like, women that chose to be independent, who chose to be well-educated and self-motivated. Um, sure. So, in closing, I just wanted to acknowledge that with her talent as a writer, uh, Langle chooses, uh, chooses not only to walk that... And this might sound a little bit corny, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, she chooses not only to walk the line between science and religion in this book, but she dances upon that line. Uh, she does it in a manner, especially, again, like through, with me, through Miss What's It, that feels strange and wonderful and and carefree and as a 27 year old man reading this book now i'm still just as much in in awe of this woman as i was when i was 10 years old picking up this book for the first time Hmm. so those are those are basically my closing thoughts and i i I just wanted to focus on the author specifically what about you guys i mean it's also worth mentioning that at that time they were in a race against the russians to get to space Mm mm-hmm so, yeah, to get to space. Sputnik yep. had started, but they hadn't yet reached the moon, right? Right. And I want, again, sorry, just uh, uh, one point I just totally forgot about that I just remembered now. Like, there were moments in this book where, for example, Charles Wallace, as he was taken over by it, he was shifting the atoms in the walls. And he yeah. was unlocking and locking prisons and stuff like that. And he was talking. I mean, of course, they talk, uh, ex- ex- you know, extensively about the fourth and the fifth dimensions and yep. what a tesseract is and what it, you know, and, and geometrically speaking, what it represents and how they, they manage to traverse space and time, um, you know. But at the same time, you have to remember that during this exact time period in which this was written, there weren't yet color TVs. Mm-hmm. Like that, those hadn't existed. Well, I mean, maybe they were invented, but they weren't available in the mass market right. yet. So, like, and it continues to blow my mind just how advanced in some ways we were, and just how behind in other ways we were. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to, conti- uh, to cut no, you off, Lauren. No, I just it was a tangent that I just seized on. Anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah. Do you have any like kind of last thoughts, Lauren? I cut you I off mean, there. I like. I just wanted to get that out before I forgot. I also really like when authors include some theoretical physics. Yes. Uh, oh my God! Know, I love theoretical physics. I talk theoretical <laughs> physics for days, for days. Yeah, you, I, I love when it's based in maybe a tiny bit of real science and maybe a tiny bit of theory. Yeah, and they they to choose to walk that line and describe some ways religiously, some ways, you know, yes, yeah. physically and scientifically. Absolutely. Okay. What about well, you? I have two kind of final thoughts. Um, sure. Sure. One of them is very brief, and that is, I got an absolute laugh out of the description of tessering, okay. and how they travel through space-time, and how it is exactly the same as traveling in the Wheel of Time. <laughs> yeah, well, For again, women. because... It's, it's how course, female channelers travel in the Wheel of Time, where they fold yeah. and make it the same. Yeah. Oh yeah. They take, that, they take that. They take that three dimensional space and they wrinkle it upon itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Women fold space time and and make the places the same. Uh, and again, so I, I got a crack a, out of that. Well, is Mrs. What's yeah, it a she even? Like, there's a time when they they kind of address that maybe she's oh, I, not. I'm not. I'm not trying to make a comment about like the genders of the characters in this. I just think oh, it's kind of funny how. The way people tesser in a wrinkle in time is the exact mm-hmm. same way that female well, channels in real time travel. 
again, drawing back to what I just said about uh, Langle being very particularly interested for her time, especially as a woman in, in theoretical physics and the sciences and in extra dimensional theory, Robert Jordan, who was know, an engineer, his, that was a pen name. Uh, he no, he was a nuclear physicist after he after his time in Nam. So I think these are things that that you know a lot of. Um, a lot of authors with the appropriate knowledge that, I mean, theoretical physics as a field itself gives so much just literary gold yeah. to, you True. know, epic fantasy and science, especially science fiction. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think the fact that, oh, sorry, I think the fact that Robert Jordan was a physicist and that Langle was so interested, again, especially in the theoretical sciences, those are, that's not a coincidence in the fact yeah. that it, you know, it, it very much uh, influenced both of their p major plot points. So, sure. my last kind of point is uh, my overall impression on the book, because I am the one here who has not read this before. This was my first time reading it, and it it was an okay book. I, I okay. would say that. I didn't love it. Okay. Uh, I, sure. That's fair. Maybe some day down the road, I would out of curiosity, if I'm bored and don't have anything better to read, pick up the second book. But it's not urgent for me. I don't have the compulsion to read onward. Yeah. And I'm thinking... Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, it's, you know, I, I I would probably need an outside motivating factor, like if you really wanted to continue with the series on the podcast. That gives me a reason to read on. Without something like that, I probably wouldn't read on. It was fine. Sure, sure. It's not like I disliked the book. It just... It's a classic, so it, it, yeah. it just, yeah. you know, you, you should read it just so that you can be relevant in, in you know, in your knowledge of the subject, but yeah. you're right. There are there are books nowadays that far outshadow the, this the kind of The biggest issue I had with it was... Overshadow. The, <laughs> what um, am I trying to say? Sort of the progression <laughs> of the the plot itself okay. in the pacing of the book, yeah. where it, you know, it's a short book, so it moves along at a healthy clip, mm -hmm. but the climax was extraordinarily rushed. The climax was like... A page. Yeah. That's and why it, I told yeah. you. And when I finished, pretty I was like, damn I don't abruptly. like it. Sorry, go ahead. And sorry, so I didn't. I didn't catch. <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll hear that later in the podcast. Sorry. <laughs> um. Because of that, you get an extended for this book, an extended denouement that's longer than the climax itself, and it's it, it made what should have been the most pivotal moment of the book fall a little flat for me. Yep. Okay. Uh, that, that's fair. That's fair. Well, I did I, get I did get a feeling of that this time around too when yeah. I ended the book. It ended way more abruptly than I remembered it. Yep. Yeah. Like so way it, more. It was... I thought we still had like 20, 30 pages left and suddenly I was on the author's Q&A and I was, "Oh, it's done?" I actually had to go back and check like a, a yeah. plot summary online yeah. and I was like, "Oh, no, it definitely ended right there that quickly." Yeah. yeah. At, at one point I turned to Drew and I was like, "She's got 12 pages to resolve this." Like to have the climax and the resolution, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is she gonna do this? And then she yeah. did, and I was like, I'm, I'm mad. I don't. And this too fast. Again, I, I hesitate to bring up this author so many times in this podcast, but this is something that I have noticed when I'm reading a physical copy of Brandon Sanderson's works. A lot of the times, I'll be through reading the book, especially this is this the one that comes to mind more than any other is uh, Book Thirteen of the Wheel of Time, uh, Towers of Midnight. I wanted to get back. I'm not going to spoil it actually, but there was a moment where I wanted to get to so badly in that book, and I knew it was happening in that book, and I got to the very end, and there was like. The, this tiniest little bit of pages left, and I was like, "How is this going to be re like resolved so quickly in this amount of space that the author has left?" And I think maybe this has something to do with the Sanderson avalanche, how he tends to insert so many plot points so fast at the very end of his books. But again, I, I noticed it in this book, so as Lauren just just said a few minutes ago. You you get to the end of the book, you realize there's one percent of this book left. Yep. And how is she gonna? <laughs> How is she going to possibly wrap this up? It does feel rushed. I guess that's ultimately the point I want to make. Yeah. I agree with Lauren. It does feel a little rushed. And Drew, you said at, something at very much similar. At the risk of similar. going off topic here, I'm going to disagree with Let's your assessment. Let's go off topic. Of we're, only a, we're only at an climaxes. hour. <laughs> the whole thing okay. with the Brandon sure, sure. Avalanche is that his climaxes are like 150 or 200 pages long where it's like... Well, that's just because the size of the you book know, you have to take, but, you know, but it's, relative. But it's not, it's not like, it doesn't ever feel rushed. With his climaxes. Well, that's a 
the, the jury's still out on that one. And some people feel differently about different right. books. I can't think of one specifically of, of Sanderson's I feel was specifically rushed, but I feel like there would be people who do Wait, feel that yeah. way. But, uh, but somewhere that's something there. we can discuss because obviously... Take the size of the book... We will be discussing many like more Brandon books on this 300 podcast pages, in the future. Right. Oh my god, we'll be discussing yeah. so many so, more, definitely. I, I do think it's a, you know, we're getting close to the end of our time here, so we should move on to the final draft. Sure, sure. Okie dokie. Uh, Rob, you want to kick us off? <laughs> well, I have a guilty confession uh, to Ooh. make here. I didn't have time to go to the corner store or the, the you know, the grocery store or the beer store that we have here and choose a, you know, wittingly, you know, thematical beer. I just went to the liquor store because I had a few minutes and I picked up, since I was shoveling the driveway yesterday, I didn't want to do that sober, I picked up some Fireball, and that's what I've been drinking oh, for man. the course of this podcast. <laughs> there are some moments, if those who are listening can <laughs> can isolate out, there are some moments when you, you may hear a glass put down and you hear me going for the, for the you know, a couple of minutes <laughs> after that. I was I was struggling. Uh, fireball, it's hard. Uh, I, I, you know, I haven't had much, but my god, it's strong. So that that's... That's what I've been drinking throughout the course of this podcast. How about you guys? Mark, you want to take it away? All right. So I am drinking the Tart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness? That Okay. See, she just did what I, what I failed to do. She got something thematically appropriate. The Heart of Darkness? Tart, tart of Darkness. Tart. Oh, the Tart of Darkness. It's okay. made with black currants. It is a oh, sour stout that's a aged in berry, oak barrels yes. with black currants. Black currants a berry, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Really, Dang. really delicious and sour. Yeah. Really delicious and, and sour. It's, it's made by, how do I say this, Brewery Tarot? Brewery Tarot. Tarot? Tarot. Yeah. I don't know French. Is it a French thing? Yeah. yeah. I know some French. I can speak French. So, oh, hold on. Let's see if I can. Where is it? Uh, uh, oh, Tarot. Okay. Yeah, T E R R. Sorry, I'm. I don't know if any for of those who listeners haven't, are. If I haven't mentioned it yet, I'm a Canadian. Um, French is my second language, even though I'm terribly rusty at it. My mother's a French teacher. That's why throughout the course of this podcast, I've been saying Madeleine Langle because my mother is a French teacher and she would shoot me if she heard me saying Madeleine Langle or something along those lines. Langle <laughs> along those lines. Um, so, so I but, grew up with her. Like the teachers would say Madeleine L. Engel. L. Engel? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's because that the second E is also a ta- uh, it's capitalized, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's something that you don't tend to do in French with anything other than a name, and it oh, can I okay. think I think it can also change the pronunciation of it. But don't take me, uh, you know, at face value there. I I don't not. It's been way too long since grade twelve French. Anyway, moving on with the final draft. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so Lauren was drinking Tart of Darkness, and I. You know, I, was, I had a couple of sips as well, but my uh, offering this time is a double IPA, double India Pale oh, from India Pale Odd Ale. 13 Brewing in Lafayette, Colorado, called Intergalactic Juice Hunter. <laughs> Hold on. Intergalactic, uh, intergalactic what hunter? Juice Hunter. Juice Hunter? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Is a, now how is, is that? It is a juicy double IPA brewed with galaxy hops. So I thought oh. that was appropriate for this book. Yeah. You guys both got it. it it's, it's actually very good. Um, it, it's a you know, probably one of the, the best double IPAs I've had in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's what I was waiting to ask you. What does a double IPA mean? Uh, it's basically just like a more powerful IPA. You know, like more hops, higher ABV. It's gonna okay. You know, okay. stronger flavor profile. This is an eight so percent. So it's an ABV IPA beer. on steroids. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I have, Ooh, what I have is to the check some of those out. Oh, yeah, I'm curious. What's the percent uh, on... I mean, it's barrel-aged. I was going to ask, but I... Oh, well, that's think not it bad. Appropriate. Yeah, it's low. 6.2 for was Tart it, sorry? Darkness. 6.2? Yep. Yeah, this uh, this Fireball, I think I believe, is 33%. Oh, th- yeah, Fireball is like 35% or something like that. <laughs> it's something like I mean, that, twisty. but I, you know, I only poured... I'm using... Look at this. A Wonder Woman cup. It's It was about that deep. It wasn't, it wasn't that much. Okay, it was that's probably a, that's okay. a hefty pour. Three and a half shots, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that about rounds up the uh, the 11th episode of Inking Out Loud. Well, uh, uh, any final thoughts that you want to... Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to bring up, um, next week, we are going to be moving on to another science fiction fantasy kind of blend. Yes. Uh, it's the first book in Matthew Stover's The Acts of Cain. The book is called Heroes Finally. Die. We will be covering been about the first half of the this. book. Uh, and that one, I have read before. Rob has not... 
We will nope, probably I'll have the newbie. a guest or two on the podcast. Uh, we're not quite sure what our lineup's going to be like, but there are we'll play several people who, who have been clamoring to get on for this one because yes. these books are something special. Very Epic. excited for them. Epic. <laughs> Awesome. So, uh, awesome. Yeah, so this has been episode 11 of the Inking Out Loud podcast. I am Ayo. your co host, Drew McCaffrey, and with me is Rob Santos and our special What's guest, up? Lauren McCaffrey. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, of course. Bye, everybody. <laughs>